Assalamu alaikum. So today I'm here to present to you a few minutes of uh, how to maximize the lifetime and resale value of your vehicle. Sorry, is that better? So we spend a lot of time uh, time in our vehicles, and uh, it's good to find a way of increasing that lifespan. And when you get done with uh, using that vehicle, that uh, you get the best value out of it. So the first thing that you need to do is the route. Choose it wisely. You need to study your specific market and see what models are, you know, doing the job without getting, a, um, you know, a battering and wearing out really fast. So you need to do a bit of research, find the right vehicle for your, your application, um, and your sort of roads, your sort of environment. <laughs> will go a long way in you know the future that comes up for you now the second thing is once you've you've made your decision you've gone on a specific car um, you drive with the long term in mind so you know you take care of the car you use it to its capability uh, if you're driving a, a car that's low and you're passing rough roads go slow on it you know make sure you extend the lifetime you're not hitting the places that you're not supposed to hit Right? And then now the small things that uh, probably you learn with experience, you take care of the aesthetics. If a dirt has come on the car, you wipe it off immediately. If you, know, you live in a place that's muddy or rainy, you use the plastic mats. Uh, small things, closing your windows when you're on a rough road so they do not rattle. You know? So when you do come to selling the car or you know, later in its life, it doesn't feel like a rattle box. You know? Here's the thing, you probably think I'm doing a bit of marketing, but this is the place you can't skimp. So the regular maintenance, the oil changes, the filter changes, uh, this is one place you, you can't, you know, forget about. You must do it. It's the wajib bit. Uh, every car or manufacturer will have their own recommended uh, intervals. But generally, a rule of thumb, every 5,000 kilometers, you should get an oil change if you're using the lowest grade of oils. Um, and the recommended filters, you get your brakes checked, your suspensions, uh, you know, checked. Now remember, when you do things at the right time, then you avoid other costs and other major issues. So if you wait for your brakes to finish, you're looking at a much bigger job. It's not just the brake pad now, now it's also the discs. So you do it on time, you catch it before it's finished. It goes a long way in the long-term usage of the car. Right, so what I felt was the most important thing that you should look at, especially in our usage in uh, Nairobi and Africa, is the, the tires. The only part of the vehicle that's actually making contact with the, with the ground. So, very important. You know, plays an aspect on your efficiency, on your long-term usage. So, where you can, you get the best type of tires, the recommended sizes, um, and keep your pressures in check. So, the correct type size pressures is usually available you know somewhere in the car um, usually on the driver's door on the insert or on the fuel cap there's a small uh, diagram here that shows the wear that a tire takes when you're running the correct pressures and you, you can see in the low pressure you're only using the side walls in the high pressure you're only using the center and then you get uneven wear and a wobbly car a wobbly ride so really important to take care of these things and finally, learn your car. As you start using it, uh, try and see what's the normal driving, uh, you know, behaviors on your specific routes, on specific roads. If you get used to how the car is driving, then when something small happens, you'll be able to catch it in time. Before it becomes a major thing, you know something's not okay, something's not feeling, uh, you know, the normal in, in my normal ride. And you catch that in time, you sort it out before it's become a major issue. Inshallah, you'll get the most value and uh, usage from that vehicle. Awesome. I hope I've been of help.
My respected elders, brothers, sisters, salamun alaykum jameean wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yesterday we began with our introductory session looking at the importance of understanding this holy book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you and I. Within it, he has confirmed that it is the final scripture given to the final prophet, the most perfect scripture, the most perfect prophet to be given to the most perfect people. When I say perfect people, I mean the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Have been given the ability to use their intellects in a fashion which previous progenies and ummahs have not been given. You and I have been given a responsibility to contemplate and to think upon the scripture and the Quran. To deduce our laws from it, our theology from it, unlike any other nation before. Allah makes it very clear numerous times in the Holy Quran, does He not? Afala ta'qilun. Do they not reason? We've given them this Quran so that they think about it, that they question it. Afala yatadabbarun al Quran. Do they not ponder on the words of the Quran? And the verse continues where Allah says, because had it come from any other source apart from Allah, they would have found within it numerous conflicts. They would have found contradictions within this book. It's also very clear to us that this gracious, merciful Lord of ours has guided you and I to Him, not only through signs such as what we find in the Quran, but prior to that. Prior to that, you and I are given signs in the external world and within ourselves. Sometimes the youngest of your children will come and ask you a question about God that perplexes you and you and I don't even know how to answer it. It's a sign from God that you don't need immense education in order to realize that He exists. This basic fact that there is a God, there is a greater being, a greater existence is something that you don't need to be taught. It's something that will come naturally to you and I. He says in the Quran, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ We're going to reveal to them our signs in the existence around them. There will be some who will come to the path of God and Tawheed just by opening their eyes. There are some who will simply study biology or some sort of organism and they will turn to God in that. Wafi and Fusim. And there are signs that were within people. Sometimes people don't look outside. A blind person is no less off in turning towards Allah than a person who can see. They too have their signs. And their signs will be within themselves as they think and they contemplate. You think when Yaqub lost his eyesight or when Shu'aib cried so much out of the fear of God and he lost his eyesight that he forgot God or he couldn't see God? There are signs externally and internally. Allah says, so that we may make it clear to them that He is the truth. When you and I see a sign of God, when we witness something, when we hear something, we have two obvious options. The first is going to be that we accept it. That when we're guided to something, we accept it, but acceptance means that we act upon it and we show God that we've accepted through our actions. Sometimes you sit and you wonder and you say, I've been to the mosque for 20 years, for 50 years, 70 years. It's not that I'm coming to hear something new. It's not that every time that I come to a majlis or, or a talk or a seminar, that something new is going to be said about this religion. There may be aspects that are new. But the majority of the time, what we hear are simple reminders of that which we already know. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in numerous traditions tells us to act upon that which we know and then Allah will teach you that which you don't know. It's very easy to ask a scholar or a marja or a great mystic and go to them and ask them, can you give me advice, tell me what to do. But the best piece of advice is probably just to act upon that which we know already. Because the more we add to this being, the more responsibility I get. The more I'm going to have to answer for on the day of judgment. It's like a man or a woman who has a certain amount of wealth. They'll only be answerable for that which they own and that they have responsibility over. They can ask for more, but the responsibility will increase. So when they're given more, they should be ready for their tests and their responsibilities to increase as well. That's why the Prophet has a beautiful dua when it comes to sustenance. He says, Oh Allah, 
grant Muhammad and Al Muhammad that which suffices them. Don't give us more because the responsibility is very great. Don't give us less because we'll find it very difficult to lead our lives. We'll be hand to mouth. We'll find it difficult. We don't, we don't want to live in difficulty. Give us that which suffices us. When he married Khadija, one of the first things he did was to give away that wealth. A few days ago, we celebrated the wilada of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. There's an anecdote and a story about him. I think I've mentioned it to you before, but it's worth mentioning again, just so you understand and we understand the generosity of these men and these women. Imam is met by a man from Sham. He comes all the way to Medina. He meets the second holy Imam. Imam al Hassan was well off. He had a great deal of wealth, but it was clear from his actions and how he lived that he didn't spend it on himself. Imam al Rida was wealthy. Imam al Rida would wear nice clothes, not clothes that you would look at and you would say he was extravagant, but he would wear nice clothes. And if you know the histories, you, you must have heard that people would point fingers at him and say, but your grandfather Ali would wear very rough, coarse clothes. Why is it that we find you wearing such nice clothes, you know, presentable clothes? And he would open up his Aba and he would say that, yes, externally, it's a duty that we live according to the status of the people. But internally, if you look at my clothes, they're the rough, coarse clothes that I remind myself of how my grandfather lived. It's a reminder also, there's so much to extrapolate from their lives. One of the reminders you can take from this is that you live according to the people, not to be mocked. If you live in a fashion where you are mocked by the people, then why would people listen to you? When you speak to them, they'll point fingers and mock you. But if you live in accordance with the status quo of the people, you don't live above them that they should feel ashamed of coming in your presence. When the priests from uh, at the time of Mubahala, when they came to meet the Holy Prophet, before they entered the tent, didn't he tell them, remove all your gold and your bling and then come. We're not going to have a status war over here as whose clothes are better and whose gold is better. When we come and we sit, we sit as equals. So when you would go to the mosque, people would come from outside and they would question. They would say, man Muhammad, which one of you is Muhammad? Because he sat like the people. He ate the same food of the people. They didn't put him up and he sat in the front. Everybody knew that this was Muhammad. He sat. He spoke like the people. His colloquial dialect was like the people. He wore shoes and sandals like the people. He went to the market and he bought food like the people. And the Quran talks about people complaining. And they said, this can't be a prophet. He's come to the market. I said, this is what a prophet is meant to be. A prophet is meant to be with the people. Imam al Hassan a wealthy man at his time, used his wealth according to Islam in the way in which it pleased Allah. A man from Sham comes to him. Doesn't know, doesn't go through an interview process, comes to him and he says, I'm in need. And Imam tells his helper, open up the safe and give whatever's inside. 2,000 dinars comes and he gives it to this man. The man is speechless. He turns to the second holy Imam and he says, don't you want to know why I want this money? You haven't asked me a question. Don't you want to find out the reason? And then the Imam gives a principle of charity that should be ascribed in our hearts. He says, Allah has made it a habit with me. That when I ask him, he gives me without questioning. So I have made it a habit with people that when they ask me, I give them without questioning. I am fearful that if I begin to question before giving, then he will begin to question before giving. This is what the Imams live like. This is how they live their life. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, I've given you this thaqalain. Not so that you just speak about them. That's one step. You celebrate them. You rejoice. You sing their praises. That's one step. It's not that you just recite this Quran in the best melody. That's a good step. But action. Everything else is a means to the goal. The goal here is going to be action. And that's why when we come to these majalis, and sometimes we're given the most simplest of reminders, it's in accordance with the Quran and the command of God. Because he tells the Holy Prophet, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرْ Oh Muhammad, remind, because you are reminded, that's all you are. I have placed you on this earth to remind people. لا إكراه في الدين Oh Muhammad, I'm not telling you to go and put a scarf on the heads of these women. I'm not telling you to go and lock these men up if they shave their beards. No Muhammad, there's no compulsion. I want you to remind people and that's it. 
And then the onus and the responsibility is shifted to them. In other verses of the Quran, وَذَكِّرْ إِنَّمَا الذِّكْرَ تَنْفَعَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ People remind each other. It wasn't just for the prophets. It's for you and I. There's not one of us above the other. إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ The closest amongst you to God is the one who is most wary of God. Remind one another. It doesn't matter if he's older than you. Speak to him in a polite fashion. Remind him. It doesn't matter if he's younger than you. Encourage him to come back on the straight path in a polite fashion. Allah says, sometimes these human beings that I've created, when guidance is given to them, you know, if you, go, if you went and you sat in front of a donkey and you recited the Quran, you don't expect anything. The scary part is, Allah says, some of these human beings that have been created, they're like cows and sheep. Then he goes a step further. He says, بَلْ هُمْ أَضَلْ Actually, some of them are even more heedless. Because you know the cow, I created it to eat grass, to mate, to sleep, and to give milk. And it did exactly what I asked it to do. It didn't go away from its path. But you know this human being? I've created it with intellect and senses and the ability to comprehend and question and reason and understand and look around him. But he doesn't do any of it. He listens through one ear and goes out the other. And I don't see a change within him in action. So the first option that man has, that when you and I listen to a reminder, and it has to be a simple reminder. The Quran is not complicated. Allah says it as we mentioned yesterday. The hadith are not complicated. The religion, if it was difficult to act upon, then we have a complaint against Allah on the day of judgment. Allah, you made this religion extremely difficult. But he makes it easy. Out of 12 months, you only have to fast one. And even in that month, if you're traveling, or you're sick, or you're too old, or you're too young. It's so many excuses after excuses. There's easy ways out of it if it's difficult. It's hajj, I make it obligatory. Only you have the means. Do you know how many maraj are there who've never been to hajj? Ayatollah Marashi Najafi being one of them. Never went for hajj. Never had the ability financially to go for hajj. It's okay. It doesn't mean that you're only close to God if you went for hajj. It's an obligation. If the environment actualizes itself, if you're not wealthy, you don't have the ability to, you have to look after your parents, he makes this religion extremely easy for you. That's the first option. That when we listen to guidance, we act. The second option is where the problems arise. The second option is when we reject the guidance that comes to us. When I say reject, I don't mean that any of us will have the audacity to stand here and say, I reject the Quran, or I reject the Ahlul Bayt, God forbid. Nobody will say that. But you will see that the rejection has an undertone in some of the things that we say. For example, I do a sin, God forbid. And the innate knee-jerk reaction when I'm told it's a sin is, Allah is Ghafoorul Rahim. It's okay. And he'll forgive. It doesn't come from a place of the heart that I actually demand and seek forgiveness. Because if I wanted to seek forgiveness, I would recount my actions and change myself. The fact that I can keep on doing this sin and keep thinking God is forgiving and merciful, it means that we've understood a very different God from the Quran and what the Ahlul Bayt have taught. Another time when somebody corrects me, isn't it so easy to just tell them that, Kachi, they say, to Sojoka, right? You just stick to your own, let me do what I want, you do what I want, I'm going to stand in front of God, I'm going to answer for my own actions. You don't interfere in my life. These have extreme undertones of rejection. Rejection of the message of God and rejection of the Ahlul Bayt. Listen to this verse in the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Qalam, He says, Do you have a pledge on Allah's shoulders? Have you taken a promise with Him ila yawm al qiyamah until the day of judgment? That you can stand here and say that whatever you want will happen tomorrow on the day of judgment? Who is it that is going to be the judge and the witness and the jury in the next life? Is it you or is it God? If it's God, then we're in problems. Why? Because he's the judge and the jury and the witness. It's only going to be what he wants. So the only way to be successful in that next life is not to act in accordance with what I want and the ease and the religion that I want. Being a Muslim means to submit to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's even scarier is that if we reject the message of God, He's already telling us in the Quran what will happen. 
the disbelievers shouldn't on the day of judgment be surprised because they're already being told the state in which they're going to be in. In Surah Taha, Allah mentions that on this day of judgment, the one who disregards my remembrance, فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ In this life, he's going to have a wretched life. You might see people who reject God, who commit all the sins that they want and the desires at their fingertips, yet they live a pleasant life. A pleasant, and some people will say that he's become very successful, or she's successful in their life, but the definition of success is extremely warped. If success means wealth and accumulation of wealth, then Fir'aun was very successful. Allah says that I'll give them a life, and I'll give them whatever they want in this dunya, I'll keep giving. Because they have nothing in the Akhirah. If both of us start off on a journey, and you tell me you have to go straight in this desert, don't move left, don't move right. And I only, from the beginning, I just take a meter to the left. My eventual destination is completely different to yours after a 12-hour journey. When I reach the destination, I'll be cursing the path that I took. This is what happens to people who reject the message of God. That on the day of judgment, they realize that the small changes that we made the small rejections of the signs and the reminders that God gave us that I made has ended me up in a completely different abode. He says in the Quran, those people who reject my remembrance, they will have a wretched life, number one. Then on the day of resurrection, we will resurrect them blind on the day of judgment. They won't be able to see. There's this desert plain. There's the heat and the scorching heat of the sun. And they won't know where to go. So they call out to God. Allah, why did you resurrect me blind? Out of all of the difficulties that I could have got right now, you've made me blind and I can't move anywhere. Allah, in the dunya I could see. I was able to comprehend. Why is it that you've resurrected me blind? Allah replies and He says, So it shall be today. You know why? I gave you my signs. Our signs came to you, but you forgot them. You rejected all of them. You rejected and you forgot my signs, so today you're going to be forgotten. You're left as blind, deaf, dumb, you'll be left like that, and you won't have any place to move. These are for those who reject Allah's signs. Isn't it amazing that He's telling you and I from now? That before the day of resurrection comes, you have a choice. Fall into this state or fall into that state where the sarat becomes a bridge for you. And for everybody else, it's thinner than a hair and sharper than a sword. But if you want it to be a bridge and you want ease of entering into Jannah. And if you want a time where you have no questioning and you don't even want to go on the scales. And you want the shifa of Al Muhammad, then simply act in accordance with what I've said. Two golden rules as I mentioned yesterday. Just do the wajibat and stay away from the muharramat. يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِّنَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Allah says in the Quran, there are people who they only know the apparencies of life. They just look at what's apparent. They think this is the termination and this is the final abode. There's nothing coming afterwards. وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ هُمْ غَافِلُونَ Little do they know that as soon as they take their final breath, حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغَتِ الْحُلْقُونَ until the soul reaches their throat, then everything becomes evident to them. Didn't Fir'aun then turn around and say, I believe in the Lord of Musa? Because everything, all the parda, all the hujub, they went away from his eyes then and he could see what's going to come. At that time, Allah says, there's no test now. The test is finished. When you and I are in the grave, Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam says, in the grave of Allah with a dua at the time of Salatul Layl we were told to recite this prayer in which the Imam says when you put me in the grave and you ask me questions فَأَيْنَ الْمَهْرَبُ مِنْ عِنْدِكَ Oh Allah where can I run away from on that day? At that time the first night when I'm in the grave it's a reality everybody here most probably has put somebody in the grave has thrown sand on a body of somebody in the grave and then the Imam says when you ask me where can I move? He says, my hands will be tied. You'll ask me questions. That you know the answers better than me. If I lie in the grave, you'll say, Alam akun Was I not a witness over you? And if I say the truth, 
then it's only punishment. I can't lie. I can't say the truth. On that day, he says, my hands will speak. My legs will speak. I don't need this tongue to move. On that day, everything is a witness in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the clear requirement is to follow through actions. What the Quran states, what the Ahlul Bayt state. To give you an anecdote of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, in which he is a He's approached by Abu Dhar, and Abu Dhar tells him, Now, oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, I hear you mentioning uh, Salman a great deal. I don't think this is from a point of jealousy. It must have been from a point of finding out how can I become like Salman. The, the hadith says, Salman minna ahlul bayt. So what is it that you find in Salman? Tell me, so maybe I can also begin to emulate and implement what Salman does. What's the difference? Why, why is Salman at this station? Imam says, I'm going to show you in a practical fashion. He says, call Salman. Salman is called, and Imam says to Abu Dhar and Salman, he says, let's go for a walk. They start walking, they start walking on soft desert plains, in soft soil. They walk for a bit, and then Imam stops. And he says to Abu Dhar, Abu Dhar, how many footsteps should there be? He says, six, there's three of us. He says, turn around and count. He turns around and he sees there's four footsteps. He says, this is strange, Amir al There are four footsteps, but three of us. He says, now ask Salman. He asks, and Salman says, by Allah, as soon as I found out that Ali was on the truth, I have followed him like a footstep inside a footprint. Then I've never... And I've never moved away. But that doesn't mean in speech. It wasn't just that he promoted and propagated what Ali propagated. It was much more than that. It was in his actions. That in his action, when you look at him, you want to become like Salman. That whoever you follow Salman is what I want to follow. You don't have to tell me. Don't the Ahlul Bayt say, be role models for us, not through your words, through your action. That when you're in a supermarket and you give back the extra change to the cashier, I want them to be surprised. I want them to tell me that nobody does this. If I was to overchange everyone, they would just take it and run away. What's different? Tell me. When you see... A young boy helping his mother and father, living with them, looking after them. You want the society to ask that what did you do different to this child? How did you bring him up differently? And you want the parents to say that this is not me. You know what this is? There's a shair who says, La Allah ummi. May Allah never punish my mother. Fa sharibat min hubbil wasi. Because she drank from the love of wasi. And she nourished me with the same milk in which there is flowing the love of the Ahlul Bayt. And I had a father, Yahwa Aba Hassan, who was infatuated by Aba Hassan. So I too have become a product of a mother who has drunk the love of Ali and a father who is infatuated by Ali. So it is, no, it is no pride. It should not come as a shock to you that I too am a follower of Ali. But when I reiterate, not in speech. Speech is the baseline that I say what they say. But practice is where the difficulty lies. This lands us nicely into our discussion in our journey through the Quran, where I mentioned we'll be speaking about mercy. Inshallah, we'll continue tomorrow. But when somebody's ready for change, when somebody says, you know what, I've done what I've done. I've been rude to my parents. I haven't paid my phone. I didn't used to pray when I was young. I didn't wear hijab when I was young. I, I did this in my business, or, or I cheated in this fashion. And now I want to change. The first hurdle for change is us ourselves. The first hurdle we place on ourselves that is God really going to forgive me? 60, 50 years of lying, of backbiting, of not praying. Is God really going to forgive me? I'll tell you tomorrow what the greatest verse of hope is for the Ahlul Bayt, inshallah. But this verse, the Ahlul Bayt asks, the Prophet comes to Iraq and says, Oh, people of Iraq, is it true that this is the verse of hope for you? And they agree. 
And the Prophet says, but for us, the Ahlul Bayt, it's a different verse. This verse, when you read it, you realize that God's door of Rahmah is never shut. Qul, ya ibadi alladheena asrafu ala anfusim. What a beautiful verse. Allah says to the Holy Prophet, O oh Prophet, mention, go and exclaim to the people, what, ya ibadi, O oh my servants, the sinner would never think that they're encompassed within this name of my servants. The servant is the one who stands up in the middle of the night. The one who does all the mustahab fast. The one who goes for hajj and umrah and ziyara regularly. That's not the definition of a servant according to the Quran. The Quran says, O oh my servant, الَّذِينَ asrafu ala anfusihim, Who has wronged himself. If you've wronged yourself, and you've done wrong, and you've done sin, even then, according to the Quran, you and I are considered as a servant of Allah. But Allah wants one thing from you and I. After we sin, we open our eyes and then he says, La rahmatullah. I ask you, don't cut off from the mercy of Allah. That's it. Never question, will God forgive me? Never question, will God accept me back? Allah's not cutting off his mercy from you and I. Why should we cut it off from him? Inna Allah dhunuba. Allah says, I will forgive sins. That's not what he says. He says, Inna Allah dhunuba jami'a. I will forgive every type of sin that you have committed. Why? Allah says, I am the all-forgiving and the all-merciful. He hasn't just become the all-forgiving and all-merciful. He's always been the all-forgiving and all-merciful. It's as and when you want to take his mercy and as and when you and I want to take his forgiveness through our actions, not our speech. That if I show God, I've changed my business. I've changed how I'm speaking to my parents. I've started to pay khum. I've started to repay my salah. You think a man who has missed 60 years of salah will be able to finish 60 years of salah? Probability wise, no. You think Allah wants that he will only go to Jannah if he finishes the 60 year of salah? Or does Allah want to see this man trying to finish the 60 years of salah? That even after he dies and he's only paid 10 years of the salah back, that's enough. God never tells us in the Quran, reach the finish line. Because the finish line is God, it's infinite, you'll never reach it. You'll always be moving. And this is why he says in the Quran, Have you not seen these birds above them that expand, contract and retract their wings? He says, who's holding them up? Why? Who is it? Ar-Rahman. Why? Because as soon as Allah cuts off his mercy from anything or anyone, they cease to exist. The birds will fall to the ground. You and I will collapse and die. His mercy is continuous. It's whether or not we want to accept the grace, accept the forgiveness or not. We'll begin our journey today and we'll continue tomorrow. We'll start from the wombs of our mothers. Surah An-Nahl. Allah mentions a verse in the Quran. You think about it and you have to question why. You know, Allah mentions about these birds. That I put them in the sky, expanding, contracting their wings. You read that and you think to yourself, Allah, you've given me a book. 6,000, roughly 6,349 verses with the Basmala. This book, which is so, you know, it's tiny compared to what you could have written. This number of verses, and you want to tell me about birds? You want to tell me about hudhud? And what hudhud said to Sulaiman? You want to tell me about the ant and how the ant talked to Sulaiman? Why didn't you put all the Imam's names inside? Why didn't you tell me all the stories of the prophets inside? Why didn't you do that? Instead, you're giving me an example of a bird and the speech of an ant. You must have found something so great in that that you've included it in this book. When Musa meets Khidr, you don't even mention the name of Khidr in the Quran. Musa meets a servant from our servants. You're telling me that it's not even important for me to know the name of Khidr. That wasn't important. But finding out what an ant said to Sulaiman was important, it begins to make you question. Why have you hidden the Imams in the Quran? Why have you hidden the Ahlul Bayt? Not made it apparent. Maybe because you want me to exert effort. I said yesterday, a boy who is given, a girl who is given inheritance from the mother, they don't value it because it fell in their laps. This book would not be valued if everything was so apparent in it, if every fiqh rule was known to us. It's only valued when you exert effort. And you arrive at the conclusion and you have this light bulb moment but you realize what God wants from you.
that's when you and I will begin to appreciate this Quran. If you read the verses, ask God, why did you put it here? Show me the wisdom, exert effort, you'll find out. I conclude with this verse. Wallahu, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wallahu akhrajakum min butuni ummahatikum. He's questioning, who gave you birth? Let's start from your birth. Who gave you birth? If you've ever been in a theater, a surgery theater, or if you've ever been in a labor theater, and you've seen the pain that your wives have gone through, or you ladies obviously yourselves have gone through, the difficulty in which there is for a woman to give birth, you look and you realize that this is not a simple process. And that's why Allah says that as soon as a lady gives birth, all her sins are forgiven. Allah says if a lady brings water to her husband, all her sins are forgiven. It is not the other way around. A lady brings water to her husband, we'll realize why tomorrow. All the sins are forgiven. Go through the pangs of labor and birth, all the sins are forgiven. Why? What is she manifesting here? What is Allah trying to tell you and I? That He's telling you that your mother didn't give you birth. The Quran is saying your mother didn't give you birth. I'm, I was there, she gave me birth. Allah wants you and I to know that I give you examples in this dunya that are so apparent to you that I don't have to tell you your mother gave you birth. You know she gave you birth. But I want you to realize that even what is so apparent to you, the reality is that everything is dependent upon Allah. How many children have I taken out from the womb of the mother as stillborn? But you, I chose to give you life. Allah says, He is the one who took you out of the womb of your mothers. مِن بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا You know when you were born, you knew absolutely nothing. This sentence has, a, has treasures inside it. As a father, as a mother, I'm sure you and I think that we have nurtured these children. I have taught them everything they know today. They're a product of my nurturing and my efforts. Answer me this. Did you teach the child how to suckle from its mother? Did Allah not guide the child that He created Himself? We found you without any knowledge when we created you. We guided you. Which man, which father, which mother says, I taught my child how to nourish itself from the mother? Not one. It's for Allah. He's the creator. He is the nourisher. You and I are conduits. We are the handiwork of Allah. The mother is the manifestation of the mercy of Allah. The mercy of the mother will be untouched. As much as you and I try, we won't touch it. We'll try, we won't touch it. She is the manifestation of the mercy of Allah. That is why Surah Al-Fatiha mentions mercy four times in seven verses. And what's another name for this surah? Umm Al-Quran. The mother of the Quran. Inshallah, we continue our discussion and journey through the Quran tomorrow, expanding more on the mercy of Allah. Wa akhru da'wan an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ala ahli baytihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Will you please uh, join me in reciting Amun Ajibu five times? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Amun Ajibu Mubutarra Ida Da'am Wayakifusuk. عما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء عما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف
السلام عليك يا مولا يا رسول الله السلام عليك يا مولا يا أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب السلام عليك يا مولاتي يا فاطمة الزهراء سيدة النساء العالمين السلام عليك يا مولا يا حسن المجتمع السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله الحسين سيد الشهداء السلام عليك يا مولا يا علي بن الحسين زين العابدين السلام عليك يا مولا يا محمد الباقر السلام عليك يا مولا يا جعفر الصادق السلام عليك يا مولا يا موسى الكاظم السلام عليك يا مولا يا علي الرضا السلام عليك يا مولا يا محمد الجواد السلام عليك يا مولا يا علي الهادي السلام عليك يا مولا يا حسن الأسكري السلام عليك يا مولا يا صاحب الأسر والزمان الأمان الأمان من فتنة الزمان السلام عليك يا خليفة الرحمة السلام عليك يا شريك القرآن السلام عليك يا إمامنا وإمام الإنت والجان عجل الله تعالى فرجه وتحل الله مخرجه وظهور أكره